All right. Since we've hit the noon hour here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, we will get started. Welcome and thank you everyone for joining us today. We are very excited to launch our PGC Users Webinar Series, Science Speakers Edition, with our longtime user and friend, Dr. Mark Salvatore. My name is Kathleen Torres Parisian. I'm a PGC User Services staff member in which I provide geospatial support, but I also lead PGC's educational and outreach efforts such as this. So before we get started, I wanted to share with you some details about viewing the webinar in Zoom. All participants are muted upon entering the webinar. We will have time at the end of Mark's presentation for Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions openly or anonymously in the Q&A tab. So before we get to nerd out with Mark and learn about his research, I want to provide a brief introduction on the Polar Geospatial Center. So we are a polar science and logistics support organization at the University of Minnesota. Our core funding is provided by the National Science Foundation's Office of Polar Programs. However, we do receive other funding from additional agencies, including NASA's Cryosphere Program. And our mission is to provide domain and institutional knowledge to solve a broad range of polar geospatial problems, to provide access to some meter commercial satellite imagery over the poles and the expertise to task, manage, and process that imagery and other high level value added products. And lastly, to provide educational courses and online materials to transfer our knowledge and ex experience to the community. So PGC's main products and services that enable our mission to come to light are best described to fall into these four categories, satellite imagery, terrain models, digital maps, and geospatial support. We have access to a lot of high resolution sun meter commercial satellite imagery from Digital Globe, enough to cover over 95 Arctics and over 90 Antarctics, so basically over six times the surface of the Earth. Another major product and service PGC provides are terrain models. So elevation data is central to many science and logistics projects. And we've partnered with other public and private institutions to automatically produce free, freely available high resolution, high quality digital surface models using the abundant digital globe imagery. So check out Arctic Dem or the reference elevation model of Antarctica, also known as RIMA, on our website. PGC stores and distributes polar geospatial data developed in-house and from external sources. At PGC, we know maps are important tools, not just pretty wall hangings. So we have hundreds of contemporary and historical polar maps searchable online in our map catalog. Among other online geodata, geospatial databases. So if you're curious to learn more, our website provides exhaustive information about the PGC. Check it out at pgc.umn.edu. So we have a breadth of users from the general public to Antarctic pilots, to ornithologists, to cooperative agencies. For users like Mark, our role to scientists is essentially all geared to providing geospatial expertise to enable scientific objectives and hopefully to help users reach them more effectively and efficiently. So we spend our time processing and manipulating data so researchers can spend their time on their cool science. So we are in unprecedented times and we are working from home much of the Arctic and Antarctic field seasons have been canceled or altered in some way, and we are adapting. So we are taking this opportunity to showcase and connect our users through their research. Our users are leaders in innovative thinking and use remote sensing techniques to reach these far corners of the world in the Arctic or the Antarctic to discover more. So we want to, their findings to inspire or supplement projects due to these exceptional changes. 
So we are thrilled to have Mark launching the Science Speakers Edition to our webinar series and look forward to our upcoming guest science speakers, including Dr. Anna Lillidal, Andrew Fleming, Dr. Chen Li Dai, and Dr. Ellen Enderlin. Stay up to date via our website or social media about registration openings and abstracts. So without further ado, I'm excited to welcome our first science speaker, Dr. Mark Salvatore. Mark is an assistant professor and the associate department chair in the Department of Astronomy and Planetary Science at Northern Arizona University. He's been a longtime PGC user and thus friend to the PGC team. Mark's research investigates the geological, chemical, and biological processes that occur in cold and dry environments on Earth, like Antarctica, but also applies this knowledge to planets like Mars with similar climates. He has innovatively utilized the spectral data of the satellite imagery we process and make available to users and to compose geological mapping of ice-free areas in the Transantarctic Mountains and more recently using spectral signatures to study ecosystems. So Mark, thank you for being here and sharing your work with us and our users and groupies. I'll let you take it from here. Sounds great. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. Thank you for the opportunity to, to chat with you all. Thanks all for attending as well. Um, that was a fantastic introduction. Thank you. Um, yeah, longtime user of the PGC data. Um, it's, you know, it's been a wonderful few years, probably five or six years, I guess, since I really started working with you guys really heavily. Um, and it's just been wonderful. The support that you've been able to provide has been great. And you know, we even gotten to the point where we're kind of going back and forth on best calibration techniques and, and what else can we do from an automated perspective and from a continent wide perspective. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, yeah, just a fantastic resource that's, you know, hopefully will be available for researchers indefinitely into the future. So thank you very much. Um, should I go ahead and steal the screen from you? Is that yes, please. Okay, do. let's give this a try. Try not to screw it up. All right. Cool and cool. All right, how are we looking? Looks great. Wonderful. All right, so thank you all again um, for attending. So what I'm gonna talk about today is a lot of the work that we've been doing recently to think about the ecosystems in the McMurdo Dry Valleys of Antarctica and how we can use satellite data and multispectral data in particular to, uh, to investigate their spatial and temporal patterns. Um, a large reason why I originally became interested in this work is kind of the astrobiological implications of what we're seeing because uh, these ecosystems that are present in the Antarctic are just uh, so resilient to these really cold, really dry, oftentimes super dark for extended periods of time, and then other times uh, being blasted by ultraviolet radiation for long periods of time. So there's a lot of really important uh, implications for how these ecosystems uh, persist in these extreme environments and how they might relate to ecosystems on other planets. Um, so the title from microbes to exoplanets, thinking about uh, how we can use ecological remote sensing in the McMurdo dry valleys to better understand uh, what I'm going to be calling from now on. Uh, let's see if I can get the next slide to present. Alien ecosystems. All right. So Let's, uh, let's jump right in. Uh, before anything though, uh, just a few acknowledgements and some appreciation. Um, the field team that I worked with during that 2018-2019 field season as part of Bravo 235, uh, Skylar Borges, is my uh, graduate student, um, Jeb Barrett and Sarah Power at Virginia Tech, and Eric Sokol and Lee Stanish at Neon. Uh, of course, the Polar Geospatial Center for helping to coordinate the satellite image uh, tasking as well as the processing after images were acquired. And the McMurdo Long-Term Ecological Research Community um, for helping to facilitate a lot of the interactions with ecologists and uh, for providing a lot of the data regarding hydrology and meteorology. Uh, of course, the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Antarctic Program, none of this would be possible without their support, um, both financially and um, just in terms of the facilitation of everything. Um, Digital Globe for the wonderful satellite data that they provide, uh, and PHI Incorporated for the helicopter support during field work here. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss that opportunity to thank everyone there. Uh, just a brief outline of what I'll be talking about. First, I'll introduce the McMurdo Dry Valleys. This might be a repeat for a lot of folks out there, but uh, for those 
uh, who aren't too familiar, I'll go through a brief introduction of what makes the McMurdo Dry Valleys really interesting. Um, and in particular, kind of give it that planetary science swing as well. Why do we look to the McMurdo Dry Valleys to help us to understand planetary surfaces? Um, I'll then talk about the McMurdo Dry Valley ecosystems and some of the outstanding questions that are present there and how remote sensing uh, might be able to help us to understand the spatial, spectral, and temporal behaviors of what we're looking at here. Um, lastly, we'll start to get into the relationships to key biological and, each, and, and ecological properties and then thinking about how that expands to other planetary services, Mars and then exoplanets. So if we get a single spectrum from an exoplanet, what can we tell? And might we be able to do some of the work that we're doing here in Antarctica using very, very small data sets and small amounts of data from a single spectrum, for example. So that's what we'll uh, kind of go through, starting with Antarctica and then moving a little bit more into the planetary and exoplanet aspects here. So just a brief introduction to the McMurdo Dry Valleys. Here is a classical map of Antarctica. Um, McMurdo Dry Valleys, I uh, hope you can all see my mouse. Um, they're present here in the Transantarctic Mountains, uh, right next to uh, McMurdo Station, the largest U.S. presence in Antarctica. Um, about a six-hour flight from uh, New Zealand, depending on what kind of plane you're taking uh, as part of the U.S. Antarctic program. Uh, here's what the valleys look like. I've now rotated us, so north is now up as opposed to uh, down in this image. Um, McMurdo Dry Valleys are a really large uh, patch of ice-free terrain, largely caused by this, uh, by blocking the East Antarctic Ice Sheet over here from spilling into the valleys, uh, thanks to the um, Transantarctic Mountains here. So we have a topographic barrier that prevents ice from spilling in, and then um, we have warming and drying of air as it slips down uh, from the East Antarctic Ice Sheet into the valleys, which prevents tons of snowfall, prevents high relative humidities, and prevents that ice from ever really accumulating. Um, the area that we're going to be focusing the majority of this talk here is Taylor Valley, uh, one of the southernmost valleys in the McMurdo Dry Valleys here, um, but one of the most hydrologically interesting, just considering uh, the climate that is experienced there, as well as the integrated hydrologic system, everything from melting glaciers to down to the sink of this water, of, of these water sources in these um, perennially frozen lake, uh, lake bottoms. Um, so the particular area right here, this is uh, Lake Frixel. Um, this whole region I'll be referring to as the Frixel Basin. It's where a lot of these ephemeral stream channels that are present um, during the Antarctic summer um, melt and then drain into this closed basin lake uh, of Lake Frixel. We have Canada Glacier over here on the left and then uh, Commonwealth Glacier here on the right that kind of flank, um, uh, flank Lake Frixel as well. So these are the areas that we're going to be looking at. If you look really closely, you can see these squiggly lines. These are these ephemeral melt channels active only for a few weeks every, um, every summer um, as these glaciers and snowpacks melt and drain into uh, Lake Frixel here. So why are we interested kind of in McMurdo Dry Valleys as a climate? Um, from, uh, from a climate perspective, especially from an ecological perspective. Uh, here we have a plot of mean annual precipitation on the x-axis from super dry to super wet uh, from left to right, and then mean annual temperature on the y-axis from super cold to super hot. Um, and then we have the kind of classical terrestrial climactic regimes that are, that are just described here. And what I've superimposed in color are essentially the um, uh, qualitative rates of surface evolution, just for your own eye and just for some guidance. So if you leave a rock or some kind of geologic material out on the surface in a tropical rainforest, it's going to weather and evolve and alter very, very quickly um, in that warm, wet environment. Um, meanwhile, if you get really cold, really dry conditions, you're essentially halting the alteration of rocks and soils and the availability of nutrients and those kinds of things because surface evolution is extremely slow. Uh, so this kind of gradient here is really important as we think about um, how do the uh, processes that we see in the McMurdo Dry Valleys relate to processes that we might see on other planetary surfaces. Uh, so just to give you an example of where some of these locations are, so I'm located here in Flagstaff, Arizona, this kind of uh, semi-arid to humid temperate environment. Uh, places like Tucson, only a, a three and a half or four hour drive from Flagstaff, um, we get much warmer and much more arid conditions, so kind of a classical uh, the desert southwest environment. Some other analogs that we see to the Martian surface and other planetary surfaces, and in particular thinking about ecology, are places like the Atacama Desert, one of the driest locations on Earth. Um, we can see here fairly warm but super dry, and then Svalbard, Norway. Um, 
much, much colder, um, more wet, so we have this periglacial environment. But none of these really compare to what we see on the surface of Mars, where we have recorded no surface precipitation. We've re uh, recorded Virga by some instruments, but nothing had that has reached the surface. So essentially bone dry and super cold temperatures, anywhere between about 200 uh, to 230 Kelvin uh, on average in terms of the surface conditions um, in the tropics and mid-latitudes. Fortunately, the one place that we can go to really start to investigate the climactic regime that we might see on the surface of Mars are the pla places in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, where we get much colder, much drier temperatures than even Svalbard and some of the other areas uh, that have been used as analogs to the Martian surface. So we can use the dry valleys and the Trans-Antarctic Mountains in general as, as an analog, an environmental analog to the surface of, uh, to planetary surfaces. And so understanding the ecological processes that take place in these really extreme environments helps us to learn about what kind of eco e ecological processes might be taking place on other planets. Um, and in particular, Mars, which um, we're sending another mission to, another rover to tomorrow, la launching tomorrow, the Perseverance rover. So, just to give a kind of visual glimpse of how does the Antarctic actually compare to places like Mars where we're, we have really cold and really dry uh, surface conditions, where surface evolution is extremely slow. So here's an image of Beacon Valley, just showing you a, a general uh, kind of depiction of the um, cobbled, uh, the, the cobble ridden surface. Um, we have very few fine grain materials. A lot of that's being blown away by the wind. But what you can see are the, these, ventic fac, uh, these ventifactored rocks. Um, obviously, no vegetation, no photosynthetic vegetation in terms of um, macro scale vegetation. Um, and essentially, what we're looking at in the back here is a debris covered glacier. So we have buried ice uh, covered by surface sediments and surface rocks. We see almost the exact same kind of landscape on the surface of Mars. Um, where we have ex extremely cold, extremely dry conditions that are dominated by wind erosion. So we have ventifacted rocks as well. Um, clearly no photosynthetic vegetation at the surface. Um, and so most of what we're seeing here are these uh, responses, these landscape scale responses to the cold, dry, stable conditions that have been present in Antarctica and on the surface of Mars for millions or in the case of Mars for billions of years. So um, that's just a visual representation that not only can we think about this from an environmental perspective, but when we think about it from a landscape evolution perspective, we're looking at very similar environments as well. But let's really focus here in on the Frixel Basin of Taylor Valley. So again, we have Lake Frixel, a perennially frozen lake right in the middle. Um, you can, in this image, really start to see these ephemeral stream channels. So here's Canada Stream, we have Crescent Stream over here, Delta Stream, a bunch of these different stream channels that uh, flow from these melting glaciers and snowpacks in the highlands, uh, flow downhill, and then drain into the moats that uh, thaw and, and, and then refreeze every summer and winter in the Antarctic. Uh, so we have this hydrologic system that is uh, fairly narrow and fairly constrained to these ephemeral stream channels. And because they're only active for just a few weeks out of the year, um, the vast majority of the surface remains bone dry for the, for the majority of the uh, of, of the season, which makes it a really difficult uh, ecological environment as we think about uh, what kind of ecosystems might thrive here. Uh, just a perspective from the ground, here's Canada Glacier and we have Green Creek here. So this is a particularly warm day where we have um, surface, uh, we have melting of Canada Glacier and then surface runoff towards Lake Frixel. Lake Frixel is behind me as the photographer here. Um, and you can start to see that we have some diversity occurring along the margins here. We have some darkening of the surface from a combination of both wetness as well as these ecologically interesting communities that actually, um, the, these biological communities that can thrive in this unique ecosystem. So here I am poking at something probably squishy and gross. Um, I'm a trained geologist and a planetary scientist, so uh, this ecology is fairly new to me. And so upon first viewing this, uh, these kinds of microbial communities that are present within these stream channels, uh, they were just totally wild and really different from anything that I had seen before. Um, you can really start to see it. Here's kind of a, a classic view of, one, of some of these channels, very, very shallow, so they get plenty of sunlight that hits the surface. And here in some of these wetted margins, you can see this kind of uh, puffy or tough like um, these communities that are present there. And here's me to, again, just investigating one of them. Um, these communities really vary in terms of their morphology, in terms of their color, in terms of their distribution and their properties and, the, and how they evolve over time as well. 
Here's another part of the stream channel. This is uh, Bowles Creek here, again, really shallow. And you can see that right in the middle of the channel where the water is deepest, only a few centimeters deep though, where water is deepest, we have these orange microbial mat communities. And along the margins where the water is really shallow or even non-existent, we just have saturated soils, we can get these more black or green microbial communities, these really dark green communities. And these communities can migrate and prefer these different kinds of micro or, or nanoscale climactic and environmental regimes just based on um, their sheltering from ultraviolet radiation or um, the presence or absence of different kinds of nutrients and those types of things. Um, we have nitrogen fixing and non-nitrogen fixing communities that, that um, take advantage of these nutrient supplies as well. Uh, so a closer look still, here's some of these orange mats. You can see that they oftentimes um, kind of cover the surface. You can see here why we call them mats, microbial mat communities. They, they form these kind of nice mats over the surface, uh, but we do have rocks and, and other pebbles and cobbles sticking out. And then here's some of these black microbial mat communities as well. Um, really interesting kind of uh, forming on the edges and the margins of these stream channels. And then lastly, my, my favorite image that I took over the, the course of the, this, this field season is this one here, which just shows the complexity, um, not only from an ecological perspective, but from a remote sensor like me, when we look at this area from space and try to understand what the surface components actually are, uh, we can think about just how complex and just how mixed these pixels might be as we're trying to unmix and trying to um, understand what's going on here. So this, per, this surface in particular, it's just, it's just wonderful. We have, not only do we have pebbles and rocks here, we have these black microbial mats or these dark green microbial mats at the bottom. They're covered, if you look closely, by this kind of slimy goo that is more uh, orange or yellow in color. And because of this um, slimy film that covers it, as these materials photosynthesize and produce oxygen as a, pro uh, as a product of the photosynthesis, um, you see these oxygen bubbles actually get trapped underneath. And so uh, we're watching these kinds of photosynthetic uh, processes taking place. We're looking at this mixed pixel and this mixed signature that we might see from orbit and just getting a really interesting perspective and unique perspective on what we might be seeing as we're trying to understand and characterize these communities, uh, both from the ground, from orbit, and then thinking about maybe on other planetary bodies. This is something that we might be able to to investigate or see. So just one of my favorite images just because of the complexities that we're seeing associated with it. Um, here's another map of the Frixel Basin. And what I've shown here are areas of active ground research, either by our team or by members of the McMurdo Long-Term Ecological Research Community during the 2018-2019 summer. Uh, the vast majority of the, the reason why we're only focusing on these specific areas, uh, obviously we're walking around other places, but these are the main research fo uh, focal points is because there are only a handful of people in the field at any given time, um, just the, the, the human power um, to actually walk around and investigate all of these potential ecosystems is, is very, very limited. And this is where remote sensing can really come into play. So you can see that uh, these are the areas of very active research, um, but what about these other locations, right? Where these question marks now are? What's going on there? And can we characterize that or monitor that um, very frequently like we do in these, some of these other locations. And this is where remote sensing can really come to the rescue. Um, the goal of this project, the overarching goal, was to monitor these communities and characterize the real extremes. So thinking about uh, when do they activate? So how much water is necessary in order for these communities to activate? Uh, where do they occur? Do they migrate over the course of an individual season as environmental uh, conditions change? And then how do they evolve in response to changing climactic conditions? If we saturate one area that hasn't been saturated in a very long time, how quickly or how long does it take for these communities to pop back to life if they were uh, present in a dormant or desiccated state? Um, if they're plucked off the surface from a really high flow event, can they settle and re, uh, repopulate different areas of the, of the landscape? These are some of these questions that we know maybe on a small scale, but we don't know on a landscape scale. That's where remote sensing can really come into play. Uh, so our working hypothesis is that these significant gaps in our understanding of microbial map behavior and diversity can be addressed using high resolution remote sensing uh, that is validated in the field. And that's a really important point considering the limitations and the restrictions that we have with regards to remote sensing data. Remote sensing can't solve all of our problems, but we can start to address them as long as we know how to make the connections between traditional field work and laboratory analyses that we've been doing for the past few decades uh, and these new remote sensing techniques that we're going to be bringing into play here. 
So what are some of the parts of the problem that need to be addressed in the first place? So we need to demonstrate that we have sufficient spatial, spectral, and temporal resolution to, in order to answer some of these questions. We also need to really effectively and appropriately calibrate these data. Um, they're only as good as our ability to relate them to what we see on the surface, and that requires really good surface uh, ground validation um, to make sure that what we're looking at is essentially apples to apples. And then lastly, understanding how many different kinds of influences uh, of, that we observe affect the spectral signature that we observe from orbit. So what happens when we have a black microbial mat, for example, that's right on the surface versus that is two centimeters below water? Um, what are the different spectral signatures that we might see and how might that manifest itself in our ability to uh, characterize these landscapes and characterize these processes from orbit? Uh, we need to make sure that we can understand all these different uh, regimes and how uh, these complex mixtures, complex processes affect the spectral signature. We've made a ton of really great progress over the past year and a half. And so I'll kind of walk you through um, what we've done and how we've done it. I'll also talk a little bit about uh, some of the more recent work that we've been doing to really stretch and push the boundaries of our capabilities here, um, and then come back to that planetary component here. But let's just do a quick step back, introduction to spectroscopy, an introduction to what kind of uh, techniques and tools we're using in the dry valleys for this particular work. And in particular, how does it relate to uh, what the PGC can provide us here? So this is just a quick introduction to a uh, reflectance spectroscopy. So here on the y-axis, we have reflectance. Uh, essentially, super dark materials will have no reflectance, meaning none of the light that hits it surface will reflect back towards your eyes. Uh, and at the top, we have really high reflectance, or here's 30% reflectance, which means that 30% of the light at these wavelengths that hit the surface uh, will be reflected back. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have wavelengths. And what I've superimposed is the RGB, or the, uh, the Roy G. Biv rainbow, kind of how we classically think about the visible spectrum of lights. This is what our eyes can see. And then different materials in terms of their reflectance properties. So let's first look at grass here. Uh, grass is pretty dark at all wavelengths with the exception of a nice peak at green wavelengths. This is why fresh, healthy grass appears green to our eyes. Um, same concept for a rusted tin can, dark at most wavelengths, but it's starting to increase in reflectance towards the red and infrared wavelengths. Um, giving it its classic red color. Uh, dead grass, which is a little bit more brown, has the highest reflectance at yellow and red, so brown in color. And then roofing material, dark tar roofing material, dark at all wavelengths, absorbing light at all wavelengths, gives it that, night, that, that, that nice dark gray or black co uh, color that, that we see with our eyes. Now we can expand this concept to longer wavelengths. So think about wavelengths that our eyes can't see in the infrared, uh, and this is what we get. So here again, the, the uh, rainbow spectrum, just for your own uh, reference, is what our eyes can see. Outside of these wavelengths, all of these different materials have very different uh, spectral properties. So grass has a really strong increase in reflectance. This is the classic red edge that we use in things like NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, to look for healthy um, plant and healthy photosynthetic materials. This is because grass doesn't really like infrared wavelengths, and so it tries to reflect most of that away in order to prevent being sunburned, essentially. Um, and then all of these other absorption features that you see, these other dips and troughs, uh, these are associated with things like uh, water here at 1.4 and 1.9 microns, and then other kinds of uh, features like um, different cations bound to structural water in a, in, in a mineral structure, for example. So, all of these different wiggles provide really important diagnostic information about these materials, and we can use these spectral signatures to help understand the surface composition um, of different planetary surfaces, whether or not it's the Antarctic or the surface of Mars. We use the same techniques and principles. Um, so a few years ago now, coming up on a decade actually, um, we produced our first multi-spectral map of the McMurdo Dry Valleys uh, using lower resolution, about 30 meter per pixel resolution. So here's a, a false color image of the McMurdo Dry Valleys that we used, uh, uh, that, 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 that we produced with different spectral data sets uh, that are freely available, both Landsat, Advanced Land Imager, and, so, and Aster, and some others as well. Um, if we zoom in now at uh, places like Upper Right Valley, we can see the much higher resolution that's available to us. This is a Digital Globe Worldview 2 date. Uh, image, so we're looking at about two meters per pixel, and we can use the eight spectral bands that are present in the visible and short wave infrared, uh, or the visible and the near infrared, uh, to help us to understand what the surface composition is. So the different rock types that we see here in Upper Right Valley are represented here in lab data, 
And we can use these lab data to inform our false color multispectral images here. So here's just a label of what we're looking at, different sedimentary and, and uh, igneous rocks. And then thinking about what the wavelengths specific to the worldview two bands are, we're much more truncated. So here are the eight wavelengths, eight bands that are uh, available to us with worldview two and worldview three data. You see they cut off right at about one micron or so. So we don't get any of these diagnostic sharp absorption features, but the spectral shape is really diagnostic as well. Things like an iron two plus absorption feature that we see here in this coarse grained basalt really start to pop out. We can see this dip in reflectance at longer wavelengths as a result of that. So the spectral shape provides us with that information that is necessary in order to um, really start to understand the surface composition from a geological and from an ecological uh, uh, perspective. So using this concept and the fact that we can take any kind of uh, worldview two, worldview three image, start to create false color images like this and start to investigate the surface heterogeneity and the surface composition, um, we can look to exploit um, all of the different uh, great techniques and tools that we can use with this higher resolution data. So let's start thinking about the spatial, spectral, and temporal resolution that worldview two and worldview three data provide us. Uh, thinking first about the spatial resolution, uh, here are two um, uh, pan sharpened uh, near, in, or uh, sorry, pan sharpened visible images of um, of different areas in Taylor Valley. So here you can see the McMurdo LTER stream gauge um, at Canada Stream right here. So this is the kind of diagnostic resolution that you might be able to get. This is about a half a meter per pixel resolution with the color data, uh, lower resolution color data superimposed on it. But you can really start to see everything from boulders to polygonal cracking, some really nice surface features that we can pull out of here. Uh, the other location here on the right, this is Green Creek, which I showed from the ground earlier. Um, here's the uh, meter, or here's the stream gauge uh, from the LTER, uh, uh, the RT, LTER program. But what I want to draw your attention to as well is not only uh, the different areas in the surroundings, but look at the different colors that we can start to pull out uh, of the stream channel itself. These different colors are indicative of uh, different water depths, but also different ecological communities that are present. So we can use this to provide a spatial uh, understanding of where these communities might be located and really drive our field work or subsequent spectral analyses. Here's another view here of the um, uh, of the Lake Frixel camp. So this is just uh, uh, one of the permanent uh, camps along the margins of Lake Frixel, the main hut here. We have three solar panels that we can see really nicely. And, uh, we can even see the shadows coming from there. Um, my tents during the 2018-2019 season is this one right here, so we can really start to pull out again and tease, uh, tease out all this really nice geospatial information. Um, and what I want to show also is that because this is pan sharpened, what does the original data look like? This is not the full resolution, spec uh, spatial resolution, multispectral data. That's a little bit coarser. That's what we get uh, looking at here, but we can go back and forth and kind of see that the spatial uh, components associated with this pan sharpening is really, really helpful to understanding uh, what the context of these multispectral signatures might be. So just to give you a, an orientation of this is the spectral data that we that we deal with, and this is the spatial data that it provides us. Uh, so really a nice complement there. In thinking about the spectral resolution that's associated with Worldview 2, again, here's a lab, or I'm sorry, here's a field uh, spectrum that was acquired using a hyperspectral uh, uh, radiometer in the field. So we have lots, thousands of spectral bands throughout this entire wavelength range. If we downsample it to what we see with Worldview 2, this is all that we can see. And so these two different um, features here, this uh, brown spectrum here is associated with typical dry valley soils. And then this green spectrum is this black microbial map community. And you can see that they share very different spectral signatures, both at the hyperspectral and in the multispectral regime. So we can actually use these eight band data, even though we're reducing the spectral resolution by quite a bit, we can see these differences and we can start to actually quantify them. Uh, for example, one way that we can quantify them is by looking at the NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which um, looks at the near infrared wavelengths, which is um, marked by this uh, rightmost uh, vertical line, and then the uh, visible wavelengths with this leftmost uh, vertical line and compares the two. So you can see that dry valley soils is essentially flat through this region, um, while photosynthetic communities and the red edge that we see here um, has a really sharp increase from the visible to the near infrared. And so if we do just a, li a linear mixture of these soils and microbial communities, 
we can actually uh, we can actually model and predict what we might see based on the different NDVI values, what we're modeling here on that y-axis versus mat abundance. So if we have 100% mat abundance, we would expect an NDVI value somewhere at around uh, 0.35. And with zero mat abundance, somewhere right around zero, because we have a perfectly flat line, so we're comparing these two wavelengths. And then we can model this prediction. So if we see a pixel or a surface that has 50% mat coverage, uh, black mat coverage, we can start to predict what the NDVI looks like. And the reason why I bring this up is because we've actually validated this exact plot in the field, and I'm going to be talking about that in a little bit, uh, showing you what we actually see and how we can how we can validate this. Um, but turns out that this linear relationship is actually really close to what we see based on our field observations too. So it's a really, really fascinating, um, you know, really fascinating uh, demonstration that uh, simple mixtures of these different landscapes and different surfaces can be observed and can be modeled uh, from orbit. All right, let's go back to the Frixel Basin. So we can take an entire image like this, this Worldview 2 image right here that has eight spectral bands, and we can run an NDVI on the entire image. Every single pixel is seeing an NDVI calculation, and the result of that looks something like this, where you can see that higher values associated with photosynthetic microbial communities at the surface, lower values associated with geologic materials. Um, mind the artifacts that are present in here. These are topographic effects that we've since been able to correct. Um, but take a look at some of these stream channels, like Canada Stream, Crescent Stream. This is Spalding Pond up here near Howard Glacier. Some of these areas just light up like a, like a Christmas tree when it comes to identifying photosynthetic communities in the, in the stream channels. However, take a look at some of these other channels, right? There are other channels in here as well, if I go back and forth, that totally lack these photosynthetic signatures. And why is that? So that was something that we wanted to validate in the field and something that we prioritized as we went and did our field work uh, during the 2018-2019 field season. So that's just uh, a demonstration of the spectral capabilities of Worldview 2 and Worldview 3. Now, what about the temporal resolution? Fortunately, in working with the Polar Geospatial Center and the repeat time and the, and the uh, nice polar orbits that Worldview 2 and Worldview 3 are located in, we can get a lot of satellite data uh, over pretty short time spans. So during the 2018-2019 uh, Austral summer, uh, during that field season, uh, we worked with the PGC to acquire as many images of the Frixel Basin as possible because we were marching around trying to validate these data. Um, these are the 16 images that we actually acquired of Lake Frixel and the Frixel Basin during that time. And so everywhere from uh, December 26th, with, which was, or, I'm sorry, November 26th, which was actually the day that we put our camp into the field, or, or the, the day that we arrived in, in Antarctica, sorry, um, all the way down to the end of January, we have this pretty continual um, acquisition of, of multispectral orbital data, which allowed us to look at these temporal variations in microbial community behavior and, um, and environmental conditions. Unfortunately, you know, as luck would have it, some of these images are just not usable. So you can look at some of these and see the cloud cover, uh, see different illumination conditions that are just not great for what we're trying to do. And so at the end of the day, we're left with only six images that we were actually able to get a lot of data and get really good multispectral data from. However, six images over the course of a few months is still pretty good and allows us to do these kind of temporal studies. And so um, when we look back at all the data that are available for Taylor Valley, um, and we look at data that are high resolution, good viewing geometries uh, that lack uh, a lot of cloud cover that are modeled at less than 20% snow cover, we actually have 435 images since December of 2009 until March of this year that have been acquired over this location. So we have over 400 images that we can go and we can do these kinds of NDVI or other kinds of analyses uh, that will help us to understand the evolution and the, um, and the uh, correlation between what we see in the ecological and, and landscape perspective to things like meteorolo me meteorological and hydrological data sets that have been collected by the, um, by the LTER group. So this temporal resolution provides us with a lot of really fantastic capabilities. And so when we combine the spatial, spectral, and temporal capabilities, we can start to do things like this. Uh, so here's an animation, three images, one from 2013, one from 2015, one from 2018, of the exact same location looking at NDVI. Um, and we can see that we see um, really nice variations in NDVI signatures. So take a look at this small pond um, in the middle of this stream channel, you can see it 
darkening and brightening over time. Um, that's actually associated with not only the late, the pond level draining or, or lowering with time, exposing those mats, but also rising and covering the spectral signature of those mats up. Um, so we have quite a bit of exposure and then resubmergence um, over time. This is over several years. So we can look at how these stream channels evolve and these microbial communities evolve over a several year time frame. Um, we can also look at this over several days as well. So here are, the, uh, here are three images from just a six day period over the, uh, in January of 2019 and take a look at some of these locations. We have areas like this pond right here, which uh, fills with water, reactivates these microbial communities that have been desiccated and, and kind of preserved in a freeze dried state. And then they pop back to life and start photosynthesizing. So we're actually looking here at not the, um, new, not, not the new arrival of microbial communities, but the reemergence of communities that have entered a desiccated state. And we can look over time at how these communities evolve and change. So these spectral, spatial, and temporal capabilities of Worldview 2 are just absolutely phenomenal. But they really provide us with only information like this where we can just kind of say, okay, this is what we think is happening. We really need to go into the field and validate these data. So that's what we did during the 2018, 2019 field season. These are just some glamour shots from our group. Um, uh, here's our group in the bottom left, um, Bravo 235, heading out to Taylor Valley. Here's me just relaxing and having someone drive me around on the, on the moat um, in order to get to some of these locations. So because the margins of Lake Frixel freeze every, every winter, we can actually drive around in the frozen moat and uh, it allows us to access a lot more areas uh, um, uh, more easily than walking around the entire lake. Um, Here's an image of, of me acquiring hyperspectral field data. So here's a reflectance spectrometer where, that I'm wearing on my back here. Um, and we marched around to some of these locations that had lots of microbial mat communities present, some areas that had no microbial mat communities present in order to validate and to um, understand what the detection capabilities of these techniques are. So we marched around, collected a ton of data, over 100,000 individual spectra um, over the course of this uh, two and a half month period in the field. Uh, here I am kind of holding the, the control laptop. Uh, it's not the most uh, elegant of machines, but it works really, really well. It was just an absolute workhorse during our field season um, and allowed us to do all this, uh, this spectral validation work. And then lastly, here's me in the uh, Delta of Canada stream uh, during one of our um, uh, uh, one of our approved visits to Canada uh, to Canada stream. Canada stream is a a protected area because of the microbial communities there. So we had a few uh, opportunities to uh, very carefully, you can see me standing on rocks here, a few opportunities to very carefully go in and, re and record the spectral signature from this uh, really interesting location. Um, we also took spectra of some interesting things, right? So here's the uh, survival cache at the Lake Frixel camp. Uh, you can see bright orange, bright orange things from orbit have a really unique spectral signature. So we wanted to make sure that we were acquiring these unique spectral signatures as well. And then here's me in a really awful situation, standing on a ladder, uh, acquiring spectra of the roof of our uh, hut at the Lake Frixel camp. Uh, again, trying to uh, get some invariant calibration targets as we went. Um, so after acquiring all these data, what are we left with? So here's a hyperspectral um, individual spectrum of one of these calibration targets, these landscape calibration targets um, that is invariant, doesn't have any spectral, uh, it doesn't have any microbial communities present there. Um, and we can match that to our corrected orbital image based on these validation really, really well. So here's the eight band multispectral orbital um, data that was actually collected from the exact same location following our atmosphere correction, following our ground validation. And you can see just how the shape is, is very well matched along with the overall reflectance is very well matched to what we see in the field. So we did a really good job of validating the orbital data and being able to correlate it to what we see on the ground. Now, we also went around and looked at all the diversity of microbial MAC communities and other photosynthetic communities that we can find. So all these images here are microbial communities with the exception of the one on the bottom right. This is a moss patch that we see um, photosynthesizing nice and green. Um, we acquired a bunch of these different spectra to look at what the difference between black microbial mats, orange microbial mats, green microbial mats might be uh, to the sensor that we're observing from orbit. And so the hyperspectral field data looked like this. You could see that in the wavelength range that Worldview 2 and Worldview 3 can see, which is from about the start of this plot to just short of one micron, there's a ton of diversity going on here. 
Um, green microbial mats look very different from orange microbial mats, which look very different from black microbial mats. We have the ability to, spe to spectrally um, distinguish these different uh, communities as long as we can um, calibrate it, uh, calibrate our data and look at the multispectral data uh, over time and, and in, in a pinpoint locations where we know these mats to exist. And so as we marched around the Frixel Basin, we went to all these different locations. Uh, the yellow dots here are these different areas that we um, looked at repeatedly. Um, these are vegetated regions or regions with microbial communities um, that, that are present that we went to every week or so um, to see how they changed and varied over time. Um, meanwhile, these, uh, these cyan dots here, these are invariant um, calibration targets uh, that we measured a few times as well, just to make sure A, that they're invariants, and B, to atmospherically correct our data once we, um, when, once we got the orbital data uh, back and were able to actually uh, remove atmospheric artifacts um, using these known surface spectral properties here. So what are some of the results, right? What do we get from here? So here's an uh, image of Crescent Stream. You can see the nice stream channel. Um, the nice darkening as well, it's associated with both wetting and the presence of these darker microbial mats. We can model what the abundance of these mats are uh, using, uh, using these data and then visualize it using a, a false color red, green, blue image. So here in red are orange mats, black mats are in green and typical um, Frixel Basin soils are in blue. So you can see that blue Soils are modeled nicely throughout the landscape and in the stream channel itself, we're getting really nice model results of our black and orange microbial mats that are present in places that we know them to be. So the marginal areas have black mats and these fall wags or the deeper parts of the channel are more enriched in orange mats, which is exactly what we observe from orbit. Um, here's what we see on the ground, right? These orange mats and these deeper channels and then right along the margins, we see these black microbial mats. So we're getting a very similar spectral signature uh, from orbits as well as what we uh, compared to what we see on the ground. We can take this one step further because these orbital data provide us with pixel by pixel models of what's going on at each individual pixel. We can actually map this over space as well. So if we take a profile from the um, bottom part here to the top part and then plot that against the modeled abundance of soils, black mats and orange mats, we can see that outside of the channel we have an enrichment in soils and then when you get within Crescent Stream here, you increase the abundance of both black and orange mats in different locations. So where black mats are more enriched, orange mats are less enriched and vice versa, uh, which makes sense based on what we observe from the ground. And it also makes sense from an ecological perspective. So we can use these models to understand the distribution. Now let's take it one step further, right? We have these orbital images over the entirety of the Frixel Basin. At each individual pixel, we can model the abundance of soils and these different photosynthetic communities. Let's do that for the entirety of the Frixel Basin and better understand um, what the distribution and what the abundance of these mat communities actually are. Um, so we also took physical samples of all these different microbial and, and photosynth uh, photosynthetic communities uh, we took these physical samples in order to understand when the spectral signature looks like X, Y, or Z, um, what is the associated biomass with that? So can we track biomass as a function of spatial and spectral uh, distribution and, and properties? And so that's what we did next here. So this is a paper that we currently have in review at Scientific Reports, looking at the Canada Antarctic Specially Protected Area. This is the ASPA here. Um, Canada Stream is over here. Uh, just a visible image for our reference on the left. And then we have this um, calculated total biomass image based on our individual pixel calculations of the entire region. And you can see that the obviously the channel has more calculated biomass than the surrounding regions, but the speckling we also believe to be truly representative of, of these microbial photosynthetic communities that might be present in really low abundances throughout the landscape. So if we do this kind of basic extrapolation, we look at Canada Stream, how much total biomass is present? We almost have 10,000 kilograms. Uh, and uh, actually, I'm sorry, this is, this is mislabeled. This isn't kilograms per meter squared. That would be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, this is total kilograms uh, in the Canada Stream and in these different locations here. So in Canada Stream, we have 10,000 kilograms of biomass, which correlates to about 5,000 kilograms of photosynthetic carbon or organic carbon in this location. Now, if we have a dormant microbial mat, we're not gonna see that using remote sensing. So we're only looking at these photosynthetically active communities at the given time. 
But the one thing that I wanted to you know, point out is as we continue this wild extrapolation, and, and trust me, we need to validate this and ground truth this, so we are not gonna take this to heart, but um, this extrapolation and this approximation gives us a sense for how photosynthetic and how biologically and ecologically active is the Fritzl Basin. This gives us a, kind of the first calculated glimpse of that. Fritzl Basin as a whole has about 2 million kilograms of photosynthetic biomass, equating to about a million kilograms of photosynthetic carbon. If we look at the carbon fixation rates of these microbial mats and think about this million kilograms of, car of photosynthetic carbon, this actually equates to about five hectares of tropical rainforest equivalent of carbon fixation. Five hectares is about 10 American football fields uh, in size, right? So that's a pretty big area, right? That's a really big field of, of, of um, you know, of tropical rainforest equivalent of carbon fixation. Now we're looking at an area about a thousand times larger than five hectares of a tropical rainforest might be, but this is indicating that the McMurdo Dry Valleys are not ecologically dead. They're not ecologically inactive. There's a lot of biological and ecological activity that's taking place here. Um, and understanding and using remote sensing data to understand its temporal variations and its spatial variations is really important. If we come back next year and do the same calculation, are we going to see more or less? And we can at least believe those numbers because we can, um, you know, even if we're not perfect on our biomass calculations, comparisons between images is going to be much, much more accurate. Um, and so this will give us an understanding for how the ecology is changing over time. And as climate is changing and as environmental conditions are changing, that's really important and really, um, you know, just a really, a, a really awesome observation and something that's going to be really great to do, especially from um, the comforts of our own desk and not requiring a ton of field work um, in order to march around and to identify these locations. Um, so just some new results too, and, and how are we pushing the limits now? So this is a, again, I mentioned that this is a paper that's, that's currently in review. We're taking this one step further and trying to understand soil communities a little bit more using remote sensing data. So we know that we can identify the microbial mats that are present in stream channels, but what's going on in the soils and what's the ecosystem, the soil ecosystem uh, look like from an orbital perspective. So here's just an albedo image, a black and white brightness image of an area of the surface. We have a, a small pond here on the left. We have this channel running into the pond, but what we're dominated a lot by in this image right here is topography, right? So bright versus dark is really hard to correlate with wet versus dry because of the topographic influences that we have here. If we use a topographic model of this landscape under the exact same illumination conditions that were present when the image was taken, this is what we get. And so if I switch back and forth, this is a, a LIDAR derived hill shade model of the surface. This is the original albedo image that we acquired from satellite data. And you can see that the vast majority of brightness variations that we see between the two are due to topography, you know, especially in the upper right hand portion of this image. We can use this information now to correct or um, you know, use a cosine topographic correction to remove topographic effects from this image. And what we get is this, right? So this is now an image of topographically corrected or illumination normalized surface reflectance. And so if we compare the two back and forth, we can see that by removing the effects of shading, we can get a much better understanding of surface brightness. And as brightness varies over time, that's indicative of surface wet, uh, of wetter surfaces and drier surfaces, or the presence of salt or the presence of snow. But now that we have topography removed, we can do a lot more quantitative um, correlations here and understanding using this temporal capabilities, how this changes over time. So the temporal capabilities are shown right here. Here's again about a two month, two and a half month period, or I'm sorry, one and a half month period um, between these three observations here. Topographically corrected images. So if you look at the top left, these are normal albedo variations associated with differences in surface and soil brightness that are inherently present on the surface. But look over here, we're seeing brightening and darkening of the surface that's associated with either the presence of snow or the wetting of the surface um, as time goes on. And so in this last image acquired on January 27th, look at how dark the landscape gets, right? These are the dry valleys, but the, you know, I would say a quarter to a half of the landscape is experiencing some kind of darkening associated with soil wetting. Um, we have wet soil conditions. These are potential ecosystems and habitats for these um, extremophile microbial communities. Okay, so 
that's a ton of information, just a broad splattering of what we've been doing. Um, how does this now relate to alien ecosystems, right? What did we learn? What have we continued to learn about these ecosystems that have been able to uh, help us to understand potential astrobiological implications? Okay, so first things first, these microbial communities are really adaptive to the harsh Antarctic environment, right? They have sunscreen pigments that protect them from high ultraviolet radiation fluxes. Um, chlorophyll is typically buried below the surface of these microbial mats, just underneath these sunscreen pigments in order not to bleach them out, in order to allow for photosynthesis to continue, even in these harsh environmental conditions. Um, we can watch these, uh, these organisms migrate throughout the soils and even into rocks. So here's an endolith, right? A, a, um, Here's a, a biological community that lives within a coarse grain a quartzite sandstone that uses sunlight that penetrates through these clear grains in order to photosynthesize. So you can have these communities that migrate and avoid the harshest environmental conditions um, in order to protect themselves from these harsh environments. Um, and these adaptations are thought to be very similar to those that are required on early Earth before atmosphere, the, the atmosphere had oxygen, before we had a thick ozone layer, before we had that protection from ultraviolet radiation. So if this is a, akin to what we might expect microbial communities on, on early Earth to look like, perhaps they are similar to how ecological communities on other planets might adapt to similar environmental conditions. Um, what are some similarities to Mars, right? We have, um, very little free oxygen in the Martian atmosphere. That's no problem for a photoautotroph uh, who uses carbon dioxide to photosynthesize. Um, there's no ozone layer, so there's a really high ultraviolet radiation flux. No problem for these microbial communities that have a ton of sunscreen, pig uh, sunscreen pigments in them. There's minimal aqueous alteration on Mars. There's also very little aqueous alteration in the dry valleys. Aqueous alteration is what provides nutrients and cations to these, um, uh, to these microbial communities. So limitations are really not a big deal as long as we have a little bit, something to drive that. And then lastly, legacy signatures. Throughout the dry valleys, we have these legacy signatures of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and other um, bioavailable and bioimportant um, elements. Uh, and so thinking about is thinking about whether or not there's a record of paleo uh, biological components on the surface of Mars is really important to understanding what to actually look for. So we're currently working, uh, and this, this work is being largely led by my graduate student, uh, student Skylar Borges. Um, we're, we're actively working to understand the spectral behaviors, the function of climatological records, and then applications to astrobiology and trying to think about what the astrobiological signatures might be if we're looking at these different communities. Um, the term I want to introduce real quick, cryptobiology, this is the suspension of biological activity for really prolonged periods of time when environmental conditions are not suitable for these biological and ecological processes. There's been evidence in the dry valleys, we've seen evidence in the dry valleys with our own eyes for um, reactivation over the course of several, of, of, of a decade or two. So these ecological communities can go dormant in a suspended state for a decade or two and then pop back to life when conditions are, are right. Uh, there's been other studies through carbon-14 dating that suggest that these communities can do the same thing over 8,000 year time frames, right? So lots of really interesting capabilities and, and thinking about the physiological capabilities of these uh, organisms in order to respond to that kind of long duration um, of, of desiccation and, and suspension of biological activity and then coming back to photosynthesizing, super, super important. Um, it's currently unknown what the maximum length of this cryptobiological state might, uh, might be, but if they can be cryptobiotic for thousands of years, why not millions or billions of years? And if that's the case, then we have to look at Mars and through a whole new lens. Are there these microbial communities and microbial ecological systems that have been dormant on Mars for the past few billion years, just waiting for liquid water, just waiting for the environmental conditions to be present? Billions of years might be a stretch, right? But thinking about those long-term timeframes is really important as we think about planetary surface evolution. And then lastly, with, in terms of exoplanets, should we consider Photosynthetic communities on exoplanets, yeah, absolutely, right? We have, um, we have stars that emit sunlight that, uh, that allow for photosynthesis to occur. We, there'd be no reason why photosynthesis shouldn't be present on exoplanets. The biggest thing is where do we look and how do we find them? Here we can actually redefine the habitable zone. We don't need mean annual temperatures greater than zero degrees Celsius in order to have these persistent ecological communities. 
the McMurdo Dry Valleys have mean annual temperatures around negative 20 degrees Celsius, and we still have these ecological communities that are functioning there. And then lastly, the detection of microbial communities. This is going to be the key, um, because detection capabilities, detection limits are always going to be limited based on how far these planets are from Earth and how, uh, how many spectral signatures uh, we, or what the um, frequency of detection and the repeat time is to look for variations in detection uh, and in their spectral signatures. So just some things to kind of wet the palette and thinking about astrobiological and exoplanet applications. So just to quickly conclude, and I apologize, we're running right up on time here. Um, this synergistic field work and remote sensing really allowed us to understand the connectivity between what we see at the local scale, the small scale, and the broad landscape scale. Um, the behavior and response of, th of these communities is really important to understanding adaptations to harsh and extreme environments, in particular, uh, as we think about um, understanding the range of habitable environments and habitable ecosystems within our own solar system and beyond to exoplanets. So um, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions and to stick around for as long as you'd like. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mark, so much. <clears throat> you really highlighted a lot of the capabilities that, you know, this remote sensing techniques can be applied to, you know, all the satellite imagery that we have available. So great job. Um, we do have a question here that uh, came up. So um, let me just read it to you and uh, we can share the recording afterwards. It sounds like uh, David Sheen said, great talk, Mark. I have to run, but wanted to ask a question. The NDVI time series over the stream channel was really cool. I noticed that the background values were also changing, at least in the first animation. Is this related to absolute radiometric calibration issues with the Worldview 2 uh, multispectral bands? Are you using you know, top of atmosphere reflectance here or surface reflectance? Oh, Mark, you're uh, muted. <laughs> Thanks, I just noticed that. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic question. Dave, I don't know if you're still around, sorry, but I'll, I'm happy to follow up with you. Uh, fantastic question. Um, those are actually small variations um, in the overall NDVI values that's associated with the um, imperfections in the atmosphere correction. So, so there's not a ton of variability. It's, it's, it's stretched pretty, pretty highly in order to see those variations. So there's not a huge range of variability, but that's absolutely right where we do see that kind of, I, I call it shimmering of the landscape as we compare these images to each other. We see this variability, and in some locations, we've actually noticed that that shimmering is consistent in some areas over time. And so that's kind of what prompted us to look at these soil, um, soil landscapes, these landscapes that have typically been thought of as dead, dry, never variable. Um, we've actually started looking at them in a little bit more detail because we think some of that shimmering or flickering um, may be real. We don't really know what those true detection capabilities are. So great eye in, in seeing that. Um, it's almost certainly error associated with the, um, um, associated with the atmospheric correction, um, which I see the next question is about atmospheric correction as well, so I'll, ha I'll happily get, get into that. Um, but it's it's because it's stretched pretty pretty heavily in order to in, in order to see those changes. So, yeah, thanks, Dave and Michelle. I, I um, Kathleen, do you want me to? I, I have the yeah. chat up. Do you want me to just to to run through? Yeah, I think that would be great. And okay, then we'll sure. make these available if people have to run. We'll have sure, the recording yeah. available online. Okay, sounds great. Yeah. So Michelle, you asked about the atmosphere correction. Um, can, can we um, talk about it in more detail? Uh, was there any testing comparing the results of NDVI using red edge channel uh, versus NDVI using the red channel? Um, differences in these uh, different values, differences in the identified mats and those kinds of things. So great question. Um, I'll start with the NDVI. It's a little bit easier. Um, NDVI, we just kind of use more as the, um, just as a visualization tool. Um, we very rarely have been using that um, uh, based on the work that we've been doing here for, for quantification, for understanding kind of the quantified um, map presence or absence. What we've actually been using are a combination of linear and nonlinear um, unmixing techniques um, in order to look at surface end members. So look at those mat communities, look at the dry soils and wet soils, use them as library end members, and then try to model the spectral shape 
uh, and then using that model to derive a percent abundance at the surface. So we, we try to do a little bit more sophisticated, but the NDVI just does a really great job of, of pulling, pulling out those variations um, by eye. But it's a great question. I actually haven't fiddled with the NDVI too much to know if, if we're getting variations uh, based on different Mac communities or things like that. Something that's great to take a look at and, and, and certainly I think more work is needed there. Um, with regards to the atmospheric correction, um, we historically have been using uh, in-scene atmospheric correction. So uh, kind of looking at shadows using dark object subtraction and some of the other kind of classic um, atmospheric correction techniques because we didn't have ground validation. However, after the 2018-2019 field season, we collected some of these invariant um, uh, calibration targets with varying albedo and varying surface properties that actually allowed us to do a uh, forced ground validation. So we correct the top of atmosphere reflectance uh, and then we force the top of atmosphere correction uh, uh, re reflectance to match the va ground validation points that we've acquired in the field. And so what we've been able to do then, then is kind of use the exact same atmosphere correction on all the images in Taylor Valley that we've acquired over the past decade or so um, and know that we're kind of comparing apples to apples there. We're not going to see the same type of residual atmospheric artifacts that we were seeing earlier with using the in-scene uh, correction capability. So, um, it's not perfect for sure, and anytime that we go back to the valleys, we definitely need to collect a dozen more invariant ground calibra cal calibration points in order to uh, update that calibration uh, algorithm. Um, but the ability to use these ground validation points, and I'm happy to share them with you if you have remote sensing um, uses in, in, in Taylor Valley, um, that's been really helpful and we've gotten some really good results with that. So yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, Paul, I see uh, you've connected Dry Valley's field work with possible dormant microbes on exoplanets. What is next? I, I don't know, Paul, you tell me. Um, <laughs> you know, the more data that pop up and the more, um, you know, the more, the more detail that we can get these corrections, the more validation we can get, it really opens the doors to brand new questions. And I would argue, you know, the hunt for photosynthetic signatures on Mars, um, we haven't found any yet, obviously, right? That would be groundbreaking news. Um, I think the really more interesting things that we're seeing are things like soil ecology in the dry valleys. And I would argue that um, that's almost harder than looking for photosynthetic communities on other planets or exoplanets, because um, we're trying to understand the, the connection between things like ground moisture, um, salinity of soils and soil moisture salinity, um, pore space, grain size, all these other things to what really drives the ecology in the dry valleys. And using remote sensing, you know, every time we think we've pushed the boundary to the point where we're at its limit, we find a new correction or we chat with you all at the PGC or we have conversations with colleagues. I mean, Joe Levy is really leading a lot of these um, really fantastic remote sensing capabilities because he's been flying hyperspectral drones uh, in the valleys and in other places throughout the country, th throughout the US to really um, nail down some of these principles and properties Every time we get new data or new collaborations like that, it really opens the door to the next question. And so I would argue that, you know, what's next is being able to remotely detect soil communities or soil ecology, soil habitability um, from orbit in the dry valleys. I mean, I think that's, that's something that a year ago, if you had asked me if we could do, I would have shaken my head and said, absolutely no way. We just don't have the data. But, you know, some of these topographic corrections and other things are really starting to open new doors. So. I would say that's what's next, right? Exoplanets, we'll, we'll get to them when we get to them, but we, there's a ton of unanswered questions right now, e even in the valleys. And the ability to link that to what the LTER program has been doing is, uh, is really compelling and really an interesting, an interesting avenue. To go keep, <clears throat> to keep um, on that topic of, you know, topological corrections, we have um, actually one of the PGCers, Eric Hasby, asked, um, you know, how could we, do you see applications where using a coarser DEM, such as, you know, RIMA or sets and DEMs produced by PGC could be applied? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, and, and let me go back to the slides here. Let's see if I'm still, I think I'm still sharing my screen. So yeah, here's the, here's the um, kind of the animation back and forth between the original image and the topographically corrected image. Um, this is really, this, this benefits from the high resolution LIDAR. Um, with the high resolution LIDAR, we can essentially keep the native spectral or spatial resolution of the WorldView 2, WorldView 3 data uh, in order to get this 
really pristine resolution. Um, there's no reason why we can't do this with 30 meter per pixel DEMs and Landsat data, for example. The biggest issue is going to be, and that we found here, is that um, small temporal variations in image acquisition lead to big illumination variations because we're at really high latitudes, uh, really low solar elevation angles, those kinds of things. And so as long as we could effectively model when the image was taken, what the illumination conditions were doing at the time, you can imagine running one of these from the entirety of the Antarctic continent, the solar angle changes with space um, over larger spatial extents. So at small areas, you can really narrow it down and focus it. At larger areas, that's the only fear that I have is that we won't be able to really make that um, really good match between the model topography uh, and, the, and the image. So again, here's the topography um, using the metadata from the Worldview 2, um, you know, the Worldview 2, um, metadata file um, based on solar elevation angle and solar azimuth, and this is what the original image looks like. It's just a, it's a perfect match. Um, you know, the ability to know exactly what the solar conditions are doing at any given time really allows us to do this. So um, I do think there's, there's application, and I think there's probably valley-wide applications. And it really all depends on what you want, right? So um, if you're a geologist, you know, if, if, if you don't care about the ecology or soil moisture, if you're a geologist, you only need to do this once. And once you have this product here, then it's good to go and you can use it forever. Um, if you're looking for changes over time, that's where kind of modeling this with multiple images over, over multiple years is, is really going to be necessary. Great. Thank you so much. I think I, we have one more question. Do you mind? No, not at all. Sure. Okay. okay. So from Alex Mashad says, this was a really great ecological understanding of the McMurdo Dry Valleys. I enjoyed this very much. The distribution of the two mat types, the Nostock and Formidium, sorry if I'm getting Got it, no, got it. <laughs> follows their ecological niche, where Nostock doesn't like shear strain and stays to the edge of the streams. Have you considered validating your remote sensing with hydrology models? that may be able to show where these mats may exist? Great question. And that's actually, we have a, uh, we have a paper right now that's in press at Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution um, that's led by Eric Sokol, who's a research scientist at the National Ecological Observatory Network. He's a co-PI on this project as well. Um, that's looking at just that. So he's doing some ecological modeling using all the different data that we have, including remote sensing data and the presence and absence of these mats um, at different locations to understand what drives metacommunity dynamics. And, and you know, is it hydrology? Is it, uh, you know, what are the main drivers uh, it, it, essentially? Um, and so this, this, uh, this imagery has been used to inform those models and the, and the products that we've been producing has been used to inform those models. Um, and then he, myself and, and, and others are working on these more broad general landscape models, which will incorporate everything like uh, topography, slope aspect, um, flow accumulation, right? Where you can take every single pixel in a DEM and model, kind of if you were to drop a glass of water on that pixel, where's it going? How much water has accumulated um, over the landscape? We can use all of those different properties and parameters to do the exact same kind of analyses as well, to understand whether or not um, our knowledge of where these communities exist match what we can um, ecologically predict using these different uh, using these different models. So, uh, fantastic question. I think the capabilities are certainly there, and the the capability of more localized studies is something that's really interesting to me as well. And so, happy to to collaborate um, and provide data, provide um, these kinds of techniques to anyone who might be interested. So, thank you. Great. Well, I think we'll wrap it up now. Um, thank you for, um, I'm sorry, I missed what the track. Oh, no, uh, again, I'm a geologist. This is all brand new to me, uh, just on the top of my mind. So <laughs> definitely didn't miss anything. There's too much out there. Well, thank you everybody for joining and we will make uh, this recording available on our website and uh, be sure to tune in for future um, guest speakers like Mark, it was great to have you and um, thanks again. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you all.